Everybody, we are checking out Prodigy, my inf my infamous life, the legendary Prodigy from the legendary group, hip hop group, Mob Deep. Let's go ahead and check this out, guys. Give me that thumbs up button, and I'm going to come back with my reaction. Skin plenty times, surrounded by crash dummies and empty minds. Get your shit together, done, see between the lines. Stay awoke to the ways of the wickedest kind. Infamous, cause of the way I write rhymes. Genesis. Soon after Murder Music went platinum in 1999, we hit the road for two months on the Family Values Tour. Our biggest tour yet, with Limp Biscuit, Run DMC, and a bunch of rock acts. 60 shows across America, 30,000 people a night. We took Noid and Stobo along, and Alchemist was our DJ. If we thought we knew something about groupies, we hadn't seen shit. Until we seen rock star groupies. Hmm. Chicks lined up in packs to get inside Limp Bizkit's dressing room after the show. We were in front of a huge crowd every night. So it was important for us to put together a real theatrical performance. Hmm. There were barbed wire fences on stage. And Alchemist introduced us like we were coming home from jail to perform. <laughs> Security guards walked us onto the stage handcuffed and shackled in orange prison uniforms. The guards uncuffed us, and we went crazy running around with a lot of energy. The white kids in the audience loved us. I didn't know how they were going to respond to us because most of our past shows were in the hood. But the crowd knew every word to our songs, especially Quiet Storm and Shook Ones. Man, we had a lot of fun on that tour. After the shows, we chilled with Limp Biscuit in their dressing room and tour bus. Alchemist was cool with their DJ, Lethal, who was House of Pain's DJ and produced their hit, Jump Around. Al met him growing up in Los Angeles through DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill. Lethal had a nice studio set up on their bus, so we hung out and made music. Mm -hmm. One night, after the show, Limbiscuit had a dentist backstage with a big tank of happy gas, nitrous oxide, filling up giant balloons and handing them out to get high. One dude took a whole balloon, and as he stumbled off, he fell flat on his face. <laughs> I took a whole balloon to the head, and that shit felt crazy. My boy Stobo took one, too. We roamed around backstage feeling like we were floating, fucking with the girls. Havoc would never try nothing like that, but I was like, fuck it, you only live once. I figured if this is the stuff that we get at the dentist's office, then what harm could it do? Mm. I can't even remember what it felt like. It just made me laugh a lot. Ja Rule was on the tour for a few weeks, and we shared the same dressing room with him one day. I never really liked Ja's music. <laughs> I understood his female targeted songs, but where I'm from, nobody listens to Ja Rule. Mm. A few years earlier, Steve Rifkin invited me and a few of my dudes to some dress-up party in the city. I'll be there, but I'm coming in my street clothes, I told Steve. That's cool, he said. I just want you there. We look real thugged out compared to the rest of the crowd. Then Ja Rule walked into the party in a loosely knitted sweater with his nipples practically popping out the spaces in the knit. <laughs> it looked real homosexual. <laughs> I would pay good money to see the embarrassed look on his face again when he saw us standing there. The dudes I was with didn't have any mercy, laughing right in front of him. So, on tour, we had to share the same dressing room with this dickhead, and he was putting on an ice grill, acting like he was tough now and too big to even talk to us. Something had definitely changed. The tour ended right before the new year. We went home and got our platinum plaques for murder music. The plaques had blood splashes on them, just like our album cover. I started hitting the studio every day to finish H&IC and and the Murder Music movie soundtrack. I asked DeLorean and Draws from Havoc's Block to help me find some new rappers from QB for the soundtrack. And they started spreading the word. I showed a lot of niggas love on that soundtrack and gave a lot of dudes their first check ever, paying people $2,500 for a song or a beat. Nas 
was working on an album called QB's Finest at that same time. I found out that his QB album stood for Queens Borough. He was getting all the Queens rappers together like LL Cool J, Kooji Rap, Run DMC, The Lost Boys. But when Nas heard about what I was doing with the new rappers from the bridge, he changed his Queens Borough into Queens Bridge because he didn't want me to be the first to get all the new artists from QB together. Nas saw himself as king of Queensbridge, so he had to be the first to pull it off. Nas didn't know that I had people around him who would come tell me everything. Nas started booking studio sessions in a room right next to me in Soundtrack Studios. So whoever I had come and doing songs, he could intercept and have them come up with a hit session too. Funny ass nigga. Ever since I first started coming to Queensbridge with Havoc in 1989, Nas always acted as if he was too good to fuck with Marv Deep. Mm. He started doing songs with us after Shook Ones blew up, but Nas treated it like it was strictly business. He never tried to hang out or be cool with us, and definitely not me. Probably because he thought I was whack at first. That's mm. understandable. I would have acted the same way if I was him. But while we were both working at Soundtrack Studios, I learned that Nas was suddenly being managed by Chris Lighty, and he started calling my crib like he really wanted to be homies now. Kiki would tell me that Nas called. We were both in shock. Why the sudden drastic change of heart? The only thing I can attribute it to was the platinum success of murder music. One day, Nas asked me to join his session and spit something for the QB's finest. I did a verse on a song called The Bridge 2001. Me and my dogs coming through, we the grain, go against us, you feel the pain. After I laid my verse, Nas and I kicked it for a few hours for the first time, talking about the rap game. I told him that I thought Jay-Z was taking shots at Mob Deep in his song Where I'm From on In My Lifetime Volume 1. Jay had a line in that song. I'm from the place where you and your little mans hung out in every verse in your rhymes. The only person in the history of rap music who talked about Marcy Projects in a verse was yours truly, me, on the infamous song, Trife Life. I rhymed. Every angle of the car was smoked out and tinted, so we couldn't tell if the enemy was in it. It might have been TNT. I wasn't trying to wait and see we... Jetted through Marcy, cause D's ain't bagging me. Jay was definitely talking about me. On the song, Money Cash Hoes, with DMX, Jay said, New York's been soft ever since Snoop came through and crushed the buildings. I'm trying to restore the feelings. Jay was quieted in the church mouse when the Snoop and Pac, Marv Deep and Biggie drama was on fire. Hmm. Jay was nowhere around when all that shit with Pac was popping off. But that's how it was in rap. Niggas always going at each other, saying slick shit in their rhymes. If you said something slick, I caught it. And best believe, I came right back at you. Jay wasn't shooting videos in the projects until he saw your video halftime and I shook ones and survival of the fittest videos, I pointed out to Nas. The projects ain't even Jay style. He was on some speedboat, Versace, champagne party in the Bahamas getting the tan type shit. <laughs> Before his success, I had seen Jay at different functions over the years, but mostly at Club Esso, where he threw Cristal parties. Biggie used to come through, too. That thumbs up button, guys. Give me that thumbs up button. Appreciate it. I knew Jay style because I watched him come up, and now Jay was copying our style. Plus, Jay and his little rap protege, Memphis Bleak, with dissing Nas on songs without saying Nas's name. We should put Jay on blast in our verses for biting our style and taking subliminal shots at us, I told Nas. Nah, fuck him, Nas said. He ain't nobody to be dissing. All right, cool, I replied. I'm going to deal with him on my own. <laughs> Nas didn't see what I saw. I knew exactly what Jay was doing, taking cheap shots on the low. Fuck that. J 
Jay wanted to take indirect shots, it was my turn to shoot directly at him. Jay-Z had animosity towards Nas because he wanted Nas to be in his In My Lifetime video. Nas refused. Jay even got Nas's phone number from <clears throat> E-Money Bags and called Nas personally, but Nas still wouldn't do it. Things were about to boil over. The next day, I started working at Soundtrack early, aiming to complete four songs per day. Clean and sober again after the Limp Biscuit tour, I didn't allow anyone to smoke in Studio A while I was working. What y'all think about this, man? This is uh, a little snippet of the autobiography of Mob Deep's Prodigy, My Infamous Life. I didn't know that him and Ja, I didn't know Ja Rule and Prodigy was beefing like that. I didn't know that they, they, they wasn't feeling Ja Rule. But you know, though, you know what I'm saying? To be devil's advocate, though, I wasn't a big fan of Ja Rule. Ja Rule music was like street thug music for, for chicks. When when Ja Rule was high, his stuff mostly was for girls. You know, now that I think back, yeah, I don't think I was like in my late teens. Maybe I might have been in my early twenties when when Ja Rule first blew up. It was mostly girls. They would play his stuff all the time on the radio, though. They would Ja Rule, Ja Rule. They would play Ja Rule stuff all the time on the radio. But I think that his stuff just—I think it just resonated with girls, like. I, I can't remember any dudes really bumping Ja Rule like that. He had one song, I think, that really was, um, what's that one song he had? Holla, holla, murder. That was the only song I think that dudes really would bump. Because it was kind of like a, a thuggish kind of raw. And I think he made that song because I think he knew he was he was leaning too much to the females. Like, he was really like the new wave LL. You know what I'm saying? LL music was mostly for like females. You know what I'm saying? He was like street hip hop for like females. That's the way I kind of seen Ja Rule. Like I said, he had that one song called Holla Holla that was kind of like street. You know what I'm saying? That was kind of like that went hard. But the rest of his stuff was mostly like he did a song with, I think that really pushed him over like the pop cult, the, you know what I'm saying? Like the pop edge when he did that song with uh, with uh, Jennifer Lopez. I forgot. I, uh, I, I'm real the way you talk the way that song I think really kind of put him over to okay yeah this dude's straight for pop he's you know he's pop and plus he's for females and then when 50 Cent came around 50 Cent pretty much just took him out the game I think what y'all think leave your comments and subscribe to Charles and Ezra hit that thumbs up button appreciate it.